stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict, in this his glorious day. He thought a man now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, he dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each pace put on with prayer. When duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh, the crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We'll be talking at the end of the message tonight a little bit about that spiritual armor that we have to put on as we engage in conflict because that's where we see the Apostle Paul tonight engaging in his first battle after salvation. Very interesting as he is thrust into that and the opportunities and the victories that God gives to him in the initial battles that he faces. Something that we need to remember is it is the Lord that gives us victory and not someone else. Certainly not ourselves. We're turning to Acts chapter 9, verses 17 through 19 tonight, which is the message entitled, Confounding the Jews. Acts chapter 9, 17 through 18. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here tonight. We pray for your encouragement to us as we study your word. We pray that you will direct our thinking and that you will help us to learn to trust you, not to trust the arm of flesh. It will fail us every time. Help us to learn to walk in the power of your spirit. Help us to know the word of God so that we have our swords sharpened and uh, we are able to use them in a way that defeats the enemy and brings glory to Jesus Christ, the one who is our Savior. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word tonight, that it will be a blessing to our hearts, that it will accomplish that which you have set it to accomplish, and that every one of us will go forth from this place encouraged to serve our Lord Jesus Christ and to do battle with the spiritual host above, those who are standing against us in the proclamation of the gospel. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall last week as we looked at verses 17 and 18, we saw that uh, the Apostle Paul, who is Saul at this time, is converted. And we saw three things happening, or at least we saw two of the three things happening. We're hoping to see the third of those tonight before we move into our text. Laying on of hands, spirit filling, and baptism. We started with the last of those three and worked backwards. We talked first about the baptism of Saul, who will become Paul. Then we talked about spirit filling. Tonight we want to add to that the laying on of hands before we go on to our pot passage about confounding the Jews. We saw that where Paul's baptism took place was in the safe house where Paul had been staying. 
We noted that he was in the house. He hadn't moved from the house. He had been brought to the house of this man named Judas, uh, which was on the street called Straight. And he was there when Ananias was given his commission and told to go to that house uh, where he would find Saul. We also saw that uh, verse 17 said that he was in the house. Ananias went his way and he entered into the house. That was the first clue that we had to the mode of baptism that Saul received. It was no indication there that they ever left that particular house. It took place in the house. They didn't go to a pool. They didn't go to a river. They didn't go to a public bath in the, in the city. Um, there was no baptistry in the house of this man who was probably on the payroll of the high priest. The second clue we saw as to the mode of baptism were the final three clauses in verse 18. He received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And the structure indicates, as we saw those two special words in this verse, of everything happened immediately with no space in between, no time lapse. Uh, we saw that word used of the lame man who received strength immediately into his feet and ankles as Peter lifted him up. We mentioned that in passing this morning in the message uh, earlier today. We saw that that was the word that was used when Sapphira dropped dead at Peter's feet. It wasn't a long, drawn-out thing. It was immediate. It happened instantaneously. So when Saul received his sight, he was baptized immediately. They didn't go anywhere for it. As we saw, Paul is a man of uh, action, and uh, he got saved, and he wanted to be baptized right away. Then we saw probably the mode that was used would have been a mode that he would have been familiar with. Speaking of the mode that, would, that the Messiah would baptize with, Isaiah writes, As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. <clears throat> The Messiah is spoken of here as sprinkling many nations. And then also, because baptism does give to us a symbol of one of the works of the Holy Spirit, we find what the Spirit would do as prophesied in Joel chapter 2. And Paul was a man who knew the Old Testament. He did not have the understanding or illumination yet of the Holy Spirit until he was saved. You can know a great deal about the Bible without knowing the God of the Bible, and that was the case with Saul. But he would have known certainly certain facts. And Joel chapter 2 speaks of the coming of the Holy Spirit. This has already taken place in Acts chapter 2. By the time we get to Acts 9, Saul would have witnessed the baptism of those who were saved on the day of Pentecost and other believers who by Acts chapter 5, according to the text, numbered at least 8,000 people. He would have seen some of those baptisms taking place before he finally got his commission to go and begin arresting the Christians. And Joel prophesies what the Spirit would do in Joel 2, 28 and 29. It shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Verse 29, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. He would have received probably one of those two forms of baptism, either sprinkling or pouring. Because what it says is he arose and was baptized, literally, it reads, and standing he was baptized. You can't be immersed while you're standing, uh, but you can be either sprinkled or poured. And that is what the text tells us here. The only other possibility, as we noted last week, was that this is not referring to water baptism, but to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there are those that hold to that, especially those who do not want to admit that Saul was either sprinkled or poured. And so they would rather leave Saul as an unbaptized Jew uh, and have the baptism of the Spirit than admit that there's sprinkling and pouring, which opens up the possibility also, of course, of infant baptism, household baptisms. We noted also that Paul received a different commission than the commission received by the other apostles. When Jesus had commissioned the other apostles, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And we've already studied all of those instances in the book of Acts and beyond where that baptismal formula, in fact, is never even used. 
Jesus gives that as a formula, but we never found it anywhere else other than in Matthew chapter 28, 19. And then we saw that Saul received a different commission in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. That was the leading Jew. Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. Gaius is mentioned um, in the epistle to the Romans where Paul was writing from Corinth and he said uh, Gaius is the owner of the house in which the church meets. He mentions that over in the book of Romans chapter 16. Gaius, mine host and of the whole church saluteth you. In Acts 18.8 we find that there were many Corinthians baptized but the only one that Paul could remember there was Crispus. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. But that was not part of Paul's commission. He did it, but it wasn't part of the commission that he was specifically given because he said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So baptism is not part of the gospel. Baptism was not part of Paul's commission. Paul did, in fact, baptize people, even though it was not part of his commission. And fourth, of course, that leads to the conclusion that Paul did not keep any baptismal records. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that a little bit very briefly last week. It's not speaking in tongues. It is the work of the Holy Spirit which joins us to and invisibly identifies us with the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Interesting. Two different pictures given there. Baptism, the external application of water. Drinking, the internal intake of water. And so that moved us to the second topic, which was the filling of the Spirit, and it's not the same as the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit joins us to the body of Christ. It occurs once and only once at the moment of salvation. It cannot be lost and it cannot be repeated. The baptism of the Spirit is never commanded. It is automatic at the moment you trust in Christ and are saved. It is invisible and the only evidence is when other works of the Holy Spirit are manifested through the filling of the Spirit. As the Spirit fills you, he controls what you do, what you say, and what you think. And that's the key issue with the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's repeated over and over. It's commanded to the believer. It is not automatic. It requires certain prerequisites. It has certain visible external results. That is the filling of the Spirit, which deals with the control of you by the Spirit of God. The key passage we saw was Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. We saw that there were at least nine different things which will externally manifest if, in fact, you are controlled by the Spirit. Those nine things are the circumspect Christian walk, the walk of wisdom instead of folly, the refusal to waste time but using time wisely, the recognition of the increasing and impending evil world around us, the understanding of the perfect will of God, and we've studied that in some detail, the abstention from alcoholic beverage, a life filled with godly music, a life filled with thanksgiving in the name of Christ, and a life of obedient submission to authority. Those are the nine things that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 5 that are the result of the filling of the Holy Spirit. The external, visible things that people can see when you are filled with the Spirit of God. Those things will result in your life. The filling of the Spirit is directly connected to the cognizant, willing, yielding of the believer's body to the work of the Spirit in his or her life. In fact, as we look at Romans chapter 6, Paul uses the terms yield yourselves or yield your members five times in verses 11 through 19. He's talking about the controlling work of the Spirit of God. Yielding means that you give in to a greater force. Now, you can yield to the flesh. That's a greater force than your own self-will. Or you can yield to the Spirit of God. And Paul contrasts those two things in Romans chapter 6. 
The spirit-filled life is a life which yields the members of your body, not just part of the members of your body. You say, well, I'm going to yield my hands, but I'm not going to yield my eyes. I'm going to look on the computer at pornography, although I'm not going to go out and do it with my other members of my body, but I've yielded my eyes to something that is evil in the sight of God. Well, I'm going to uh, yield my feet. I'll only go into good stores, but I won't yield my hands. I'll shoplift some stuff there in the store. Even though I'm in a good store, it's not a store selling bad stuff, but, but so my feet are going to a good place, but my hands are not yielded to the Spirit of God, and I pilfer. You see, people, we can yield certain members of our body. We say, well, I'm not going to yield my ears to listening to bad kinds of music or bad speech, but my tongue is a sharp tongue, and I'm going to exercise the use of my tongue in a wrong way. You have not yielded to the Spirit of God unless you yield your members, plural. The filling of the Holy Spirit permeates every area of you, just like your bloodstream permeates every area of you. And when you are seeing wrong things, when you are yielding to wrong things with your hands, when you are yielding to wrong things with your mouth or any other member of your body, you are not filled with the Spirit. There is a certain area of your life to which you have not given the Spirit of God control. How important that is because we think we're spiritual Christians when we're mostly doing things right. But we have our own little corner over here where we want to keep on with certain sinful thought practices or sinful mouth practices or sinful action practices or sinful motives or sinful purposes behind what we're doing. Sinful attitudes. Dear people, when you're yielded to the Spirit of God, when you've yielded your members, he will fill you and he will control what you do say and think your attitudes, and all the different purposes and motivations of your life. Very important that we not deceive ourselves into thinking we are spiritual when, in fact, we are carnal. And the carnal mind, as Paul says, is enmity with God. That is, there's a hatred in the carnal mind against God, against his authority, and against his control of every aspect of our lives. Very serious. So when we're talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit, which is what we see taking place here in this verse as Ananias lays his hands on Saul, is something that should be the normal Christian life. There's no such thing as a spiritual giant. There are normal Christians and there are pygmy Christians. If you're a normal Christian, this is the way you are supposed to walk. This is not special for those super special kind of people. This is the normal Christian life, to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to walk by faith. And so we see that discussion here in our text, yielding to the Spirit of God. We saw that that was different from the once and for all presentation of our bodies to Christ for his service, as Paul speaks of in Romans 12, the filling of the Spirit occurs or should occur all the time, over and over and over and over and over and over again. But the presentation of our bodies is a one time for all presentation as a living sacrifice that has continuing results. We say, I'm yours, God, use me as you will, and then we go off and we try to do our own thing instead of doing what he wills. And that's where we get with the yielding of our members back in chapter 6. So that brings us to our uh, text for tonight, Acts chapter 9, verses 19 through 22. But first I promised I would finish off um, the business of laying on of hands. Laying on of hands is mentioned multiple times in the New Testament. And in those multiple times, it is mentioned in at least 12 different contexts. The first time we find it is in the Gospel of Matthew with our Lord Jesus Christ, blessing and praying for children. Matthew 19, 13. Then were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. 
But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and departed hence. We see even more close relationship in the Gospel of Mark. He took them up in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Blessing of children, praying with children. A beautiful first picture of laying on of hands in the New Testament. The second way we see laying on of hands uh, expressed in the New Testament is in healing. Mark chapter 5, verse 23, And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Chapter 6, He could do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk, and healed them. That was because of their hardness of heart. Luke 4.40 4, And when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Luke 13.13 13, And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now Jesus didn't have to lay hands on people to heal them. We saw illustrations of that this morning. <clears throat> but the laying on of hands we find here being used as a symbol of Christ touching someone for their benefit and for their healing. We see that the laying on of hands is expressed in the healing gift passed to the apostles. In fact, at the end of the Gospel of Mark, those last nine verses which liberals uh, tend to say don't belong in the Gospel, they say they were added at a later date, no, they are part of the Gospel of Mark because here we have some prophecies concerning what will happen with the apostles when they finally believe Jesus instead of not believing. They didn't believe his resurrection. He was crucified on the cross. They thought that was the end. They go off and they hide out in the upper room and Jesus appears to them and he upbraids them for their hardness of heart and for their unbelief. And then he says, those that believe, the following things are going to happen. He's talking about the apostles believing. And then the apostles having certain supernatural powers. We pick up here now at verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now that was not given to everybody. That was not given to charismatic faith healers. That was given to the apostles who had refused to believe the testimony concerning the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection. They had multiple witnesses who came back and said, Christ is risen. They had refused to believe it. They had had hard hearts because they didn't believe really in anything outside the supernatural unless Jesus was actually present. So Jesus shows up. The resurrected Christ walks through locked doors. And he bawls them out. He excoriates them because they have refused to believe. And he says, but if you believe, here's what's going to happen. And those are the things that we see happening as we get into the book of Acts. The only one that is not recorded for us in the book of Acts is the drinking of deadly things, but all the others occur in the book of Acts. Acts 28, verse 8. For example, and it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody fox, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. We see that this is something that extends now that Christ has authorized the apostles to do in relation to a healing ministry. But we discover some other, quote, non-supernatural laying on of hands in the New Testament as well. We find the commissioning or the dedication of the first deacons in Acts chapter 6. There is no magic going on here with the laying on of hands. Instead, we find qualifications first listed, and then we find laying on of hands to indicate that these men will have a responsibility for temporal things. In other words, the laying on of hands in this passage, in Acts chapter 6, is a recognition of the calling of these men and of the qualification, how important it is the qualification of these men to fulfill certain temporal responsibilities. Now, you know, some time ago, I preached a series on elders and deacons and bishops and on church leadership and church authority, and the New Testament lists for us 21 different qualifications that a man must have before 
he is appointed as an elder. It lists for us 17 different qualifications that a man must have before he is appointed a deacon. And so we see these are men upon whom the hands of the apostles are being laid as a recognition of their calling and as a recognition of their qualifications. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, interesting the filling of the Spirit before their commissioning. We find that with Saul in Acts 9. No man should be appointed to any church office unless he is filled with the Spirit. That is, he is manifesting at least those nine different external visible signs that we saw in Ephesians chapter 5. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now I hope you're noticing the fact of how many times laying on of hands is connected to prayer. Here we find the apostles praying as they lay their hands upon these men dedicating them to the service that God has called them to do so that the apostles can give themselves continually to the ministry of the word and prayer. The next time we see the laying on of hands is the reception of the Samaritans by Peter and John into the one body of Christ and the reception of the Holy Ghost. Now we've already discussed that. That was one chapter earlier. That was back in Acts chapter 8 when the Samaritans were brought in. And we pointed out the nature of the gospel expanding through the book of Acts, beginning with Jewish males in Acts chapter 2, moving to a man who is neither male nor female, Jewish by religion, Gentile by birth, with the Ethiopian eunuch. We see the Samaritans being brought into the body, those who are half Jewish, half Gentile, those who had the law of Moses but a perverted version of the law of Moses, and they are brought into the body of Christ here. They are brought in under apostolic authority. Peter and John come. Philip's been preaching. These people are coming uh, to Christ by droves, but they have not yet received the Holy Ghost. This is not normative. What this is is a demonstration of apostolic authority recognizing the Samaritans on exactly the same level as the Jews who have been brought in. Not only are men mentioned, but here in this text, in Acts chapter 8, both men and women are mentioned. So we move from just men, we move to men and women. We move from straight Jews, we move to those who are half Jewish and half Gentile. Interesting how God is expanding. We move to Acts chapter 10, and here we find Gentiles being brought in. That's the next chapter at which we'll look with Cornelius and his household. Those who are of the oppressor Gentile nation, not merely Gentiles, but of the oppressor Gentile nation. And later we'll see some others, and we'll talk about them in a few minutes, upon whom hands are laid in Acts chapter 19. But we find the Samaritans being brought in, Acts 8, 17 through 19. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Simon didn't get it. He didn't understand what the laying on of hands was all about. He didn't understand apostolic authority. He didn't understand that no magic was taking place here, but a recognition that the Samaritans were being brought into the body of Christ on precisely the same level as the Jews in Acts chapter 2. And so we find the Simon mistake, the thinking that the laying on of hands has some kind of magical power to transfer other magical power to the one who has hands laid on them. I think that sometimes in the churches when we have laying on of hands for pastors or elders or deacons or others, 
people somehow get the idea that there is some kind of a magical transfer taking place. No, it is a recognition of qualifications and a statement by those who have already been qualified that they recognize these men and give to them authority in certain responsibilities which God has qualified them for. Very important to know the difference. No magic in the laying on of hands. Even here, because this is a transitional stage that we're going through in Acts, it is not normative for all time. Then, of course, we have our text from last week. Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. We find the next laying on of hands at the commissioning of Saul and Barnabas as missionaries in Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that is called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted and we'll talk more about fasting when we get to that point. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Very interesting here. We have the church praying. We have certain qualified men whom the church could send. But after prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit directs to two specific men. And so the church holds what we would call a commissioning ceremony so that Saul and Barnabas might be sent out for the missionary, uh, for the mission which the Holy Ghost had called them to do. It's interesting we see that in verse 13, the church sends them but in verse 14 it says, So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. The real sender is the Holy Spirit. If in fact the Holy Spirit has not sent, it does no good for the church to send people to the mission field. There are some people who couldn't cut it in any other way, and so they think, well, you know, I can get free money from people in churches if I can just talk it up good enough, and then I will go to such and such a country and send back glowing reports, and they'll continue to send me money. I knew of a situation like that down in Mexico a number of years ago where a so-called missionary family was living high off the hog, and the only thing that they did in terms of mission work was write missionary appeal letters. And people thought they were doing a wonderful work, but they were living in a very large villa with servants and all kinds of fancy stuff and uh, not doing any missionary work at all other than writing appeal letters. Just being sent overseas, putting a large body of water between you and America does not turn you into a missionary. You must not only be sent forth by the church, but you must be sent forth by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that when we get there. The next place we find laying on of hands is in Acts chapter 19. This is the reception of the Old Testament followers of John the Baptist and a supernatural manifestation that follows with it because the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. We don't find this occurring in all of the different places where uh, different groups are being brought into the body of Christ. But it does occur in Acts 19 because this is a minyan of Jewish men, 12 men who have met together to form a synagogue, but it's a different kind of synagogue. It's one that believes the message of John the Baptist. They know that the Messiah is coming. They've set themselves apart unto that. They've believed on this coming Messiah, but they don't know that he has come and gone. Listen to the text, Acts 19. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. Very interesting because, of course, we know later there's the letter to the Ephesians. We know it's a, a, a letter that has tremendous doctrinal truth. The first three chapters dealing with powerful doctrine concerning our position in Christ. The last three chapters dealing with how that affects the Christian life, the Christian walk, what we're supposed to be doing because we're Christians, because we believe the doctrine of chapters 1, 2, and 3. So here he is to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, 
Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They were totally ignorant of it. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. Now the Charismatics pull verses like this out and try to make them normative so that you can believe you can go a long time without having the Holy Spirit and when you get to one of their special preachers he lays hands on you you receive the Holy Ghost and you speak in tongues remember folks this is not normative we're moving through a transitional book we don't see this happening in every other passage we don't discover this kind of thing every time someone gets saved in the book of Acts, certainly not in the epistles. That is not normative. Then the next time we find the laying on of hands is all the way down to 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul makes reference back to the ordination of Timothy. And in verse 14 he says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of of the presbytery. Now we need to stop for a second and define some terms. When we in Presbyterian circles talk about the presbytery, we think of a group of ministers who are pastoring different churches scattered over a large region but who have gathered together to form a group of ministers. And we think of that as the presbytery. But in the New Testament, the presbytery is the group of elders in a specific church. So Timothy did not have an experience whereby Paul called an ordination council with multiple different ministers from all around who all sat down, called themselves or constituted themselves a presbytery and then laid hands on Timothy. That's not what's going on here. If we had time to study 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'd see that in its context. We use the term presbytery because that's a group of elders who are in fact the pastors of multiple churches and that's the way in which it is understood in our context but that's not what's going on in 1st Timothy chapter 4 but there's the laying on of hands at the ordination of Timothy we find that Paul tells Timothy that there should be a delaying of ordination of an elder until the man is first qualified and proved exactly the same thing we saw with the Commissioning of the deacons back in Acts chapter 6. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Laying hands on suddenly, quickly, without checking out first everything about him, is a very dangerous thing because you may be, in fact, being a partaker of his sins. You are suddenly putting him into a position of authority whereby he can continue his sins with impunity and lead others into sin. Now you say, well, how do you know that? Well, we look at the context. Verse 19, this was verse 22 I just read you. Beginning in verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. In other words, these are the basic rules in relation to elders. And that's what is followed by lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. And then the final way in which we find it used in the New Testament is the recognition and activation of of spiritual authority from Paul to Timothy. Second Timothy, next book that Paul writes to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6, I wherefore put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. A recognition and an activation of spiritual authority from Paul to Timothy. Timothy had been Paul's right-hand man for years.
Paul is now coming to the end of his life. This is Paul's swan song. Paul knows that he is about to go to his death. And so he writes to young Timothy and reminds him that he is passing the torch from one generation to the next generation. He reminds him of the time when he was ordained. And he says, remember it. Begin to kindle the fire again. Stir up the gifts that God has given you because the time of my departure is at hand. And then at the end of the book, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. This is Paul's last book. After this, he goes to death. So there are three keys as we look at all these different passages in all the different ways in which laying on of hands is used in the New Testament. Number one, no magic is involved. That was the error of Simon the Magician in Acts chapter 8. There is no transfer of power. What we see is different kinds of things going on with all of these, and it's not consistently some kind of power transfer. What it is is merely a recognition of divine calling, and a recognition of divinely given authority coupled with those who are qualified. Otherwise, there is no authority. I heard the story a number of years ago, and I can't give the quote exactly, but I think all of you know of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church over in Philadelphia at one point. Dr. Barnhouse had received his ordination from liberals. It was a group of liberals who had put their hands on him and ordained him and said, Receive thou authority, which is standard language for an ordination process. And he said something to this effect. Well, I was ordained by liberals, and it was liberals who laid their hands on my head, but thankfully I've had a haircut since then. Barnhouse understood the principle that he did not have to continue in the line of the liberals. It wasn't liberals who were giving him his authority. It was God. Of Harry Ironsides, a great Bible teacher of the past, a book has been written called Ordained by God. And that's really what we're looking at. And it is merely a recognition of the qualifications and the calling of a man to specific office and to specific service as we look at the laying on of hands in the New Testament. Laying on of hands is found in one other passage in the book of Hebrews. In fact, it is considered one of the first doctrines of the faith, and it is strange how few people understand what it's all about. But listen to what Paul in Hebrews says. It's a basic doctrine that we have to move on from. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles, that is, the first things of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, teleos, maturity, not laying again the foundation. How many times do you have to lay a foundation? You lay a foundation once if it's a good, strong foundation. Not laying again the foundation, and here he tells you four things that are the foundation. Of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and what's the next one? And of laying on of hands. That's one of the principal doctrines the first principle doctrines. He says you're supposed to go on from that. You're supposed to grow unto maturity. Laying on of hands doesn't make you mature. Laying on of hands doesn't have magic power in it. Laying on of hands is a recognition of those who are qualified and those whom God has called for specific ministry. of laying on of hands and of resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permit. And he moves in chapter 7 to talk about that 
moving on to maturity. Five warning passages in Hebrews, five major warning passages, I should say, in Hebrews of what it means not to go on to maturity and of how God will chasten you if you don't. If you insist on continuing living carnally, if you consist on continuing in sin, what will happen to you? Don't lose your salvation, but you will be severely chastened by the Father's hand. In chapter 7, he gives you some of the deeper doctrines. He talks about Melchizedek, who in fact is a, as we've talked about before, a, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, a theophany in the Old Testament who appeared uh, unto Abraham. Now our passage for tonight. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul certain days was with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? Everybody knew who Saul was. Everybody knew how bad he was. Everybody knew what he was doing and why he was doing it. Everybody knew what authority he had. But you see, he has just received a different commission. He has received authority from God, and Ananias lays his hands on him as a recognition of that authority. Saul is filled with the Spirit of God, and suddenly Saul's life changes. Dear people, when you trusted Christ, Did your life change? Can you look back to the point at which you knowingly trusted Christ? I'm not talking about looking back to your infant baptism and becoming at that point, as certain theologians say, becoming part of the covenant community. I'm talking about the point at which you trusted Christ. Can you remember the point at which you trusted Christ alone for your salvation? You may have been very young when it happened. I was only three years old when it happened. But I know the point at which I trusted Christ. I was a small child. I came under conviction of my sins. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was lost. I knew I was headed for hell. And I came into my mother and, weeping, told her I wanted to believe on Jesus. And she made sure I understood the gospel, that it wasn't what I was doing that was going to save me. It was Christ that would save me, because he died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. Too often we think we're saved when we do something. Dear people, it is not when we do something, it is when God does something with us and opens our spiritual eyes and gives us life. We were dead. We were born, Paul says so, dead in trespasses and sins. You were not born alive. You were not made alive at your infant baptism. You were made alive at the point that God brought regenerating faith to your heart and you trusted in Christ and were saved. Yes, you were in Christ from eternity past. We know the theological doctrines, but we live in time present. And certain things occur in time present. And your point of salvation in time present was when, by the grace of God and the empowerment of God, you trusted Christ. You didn't do it alone. You had nothing to do with it, in fact. It was the Spirit of God who regenerated your heart and gave you faith. But it was at a point in time when it occurred. Can you remember that? Did your life change? We find the Apostle Paul here. It is clear he's still Saul. His life changed so much that everybody knew it. I think that's one of the reasons that God let him go on and on and on in his vicious attempts to kill Christians was so that people would see that when you trust Christ, It makes a difference in your life. 
Verse 22, But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. Now what's going on here in these verses? We discover God is doing something very important. Before sending us into the spiritual conflict, before sending us into spiritual battle, God prepares us for the conflict. Did you notice the very first thing that God provided for Saul was the necessary physical strength. Saul had been fasting for three days. I don't know if any of you here have ever fasted for three days. I mean, truly fasted for three days. Maybe you have. Maybe you have fasted for a longer period of time. But you know that at the end of about day three and moving into day four, you begin to tremble and you have a lot of shakes and you have... You're starting to get very bad breath, and there are all kinds of physical things that begin to show up in your life. Saul has been fasting. We'll talk more about that later when we get to later passages in the New Testament in chapter 13, for example. What's the purpose of fasting? Who's supposed to fast? When are you supposed to fast? What is accomplished by fasting? Those are all questions that the Lord willing we hope to answer in chapter 13. But we just note the fact that Paul has fasted here. And the first thing that God does for him is provides the necessary physical strength. He takes food. We find that Paul himself, probably even remembering this occurrence, later on is on a ship that is being driven up and down and up and down and up and down the sea. Everybody has given up hope. They've thrown everything overboard. They've thrown the tackling of the ship overboard even, as well as all the cargo of the ship. And nobody has eaten anything. Probably couldn't eat because... <laughs> you know, have you ever been seasick? Have you ever been so queasy at your stomach you couldn't stand quite straight up and you began to vomit? This was not a time for fat feasting. This was a time for fasting. But Paul, after he has an appearance of an angel from God standing by him and telling him that all 276 people on board that ship are going to live through it, they're going to be shipwrecked, but they are all going to live. And they see the land, and they drop the anchors out. And then the next day, they make for the shore. They see a creek. They're going to try to get the ship into that creek. It'll get them a little bit out of the angry waves, and they, they smash up against a sandbar. The back part of the ship is torn in smithereens. The front part of the ship is being pounded by the waves. And the centurion refuses to kill the prisoners because of Paul. And he tells everybody to get on, a, if they can swim, swim to shore. But if they can't, grab some board or some plank or something and float to shore. And every one of them makes it. What does Paul tell them just before all this? He says, you've been fasting all these days. Take some food. It's good for your health. You need it for strength. Because we're all going to make it. And he begins to eat in front of them. They're all cheered up, they all begin to eat, and they all make it safely to shore. First thing we find here in this text is God provides the necessary physical strength. The next thing that we find is God provides the necessary strength of fellowship. God never casts you out on your own. Maybe when you get to be a mature Christian, he will send you out with one other, we see that as we look through the New Testament, they went out by twos. We see that with the Lord Jesus Christ sending the apostles out during his earthly ministry by twos, the 70. But here we find that Saul, the next thing that happens to him, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Isn't that wonderful? God provides fellowship for us. What God does is make sure that we are connected with the body of Christ. Make sure that we are connected with a local group of believers because your ember will go out if you are not. There are people who try to stay away from church. The scripture tells us not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, which is the manner of some but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We need one another. The third thing that we learn here is God next empowers a powerful testimony focused on Christ, that he is the Son of God. 
Verse 20, it says, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now, you know, Paul had a magnificent human testimony. I mean, if you want to hear a cool testimony, you know, well, I was, you know, hating the church at Jerusalem. And I was with Joe and Tom and Bill and Henry and, you know, a whole bunch of other guys. And we were on our way to Damascus. The kind of testimony that they give in the, you know, touchy-feely kind of churches. And we were getting there and then, th then this thing happened. This, this light shined out of heaven. And everybody was screaming and yelling. And I, I heard Jesus. Well, the ex-prize fighter, well, I fought all these fights and I killed a couple of men. And I lived a life of wickedness with all the harlots in town. And I drank and I smoked and then Jesus saved. People love to hear all that kind of stuff. What did Paul preach? What was his focus? He preached Christ. He preached that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And where did he do it? In the place where people would have known the Old Testament prophecies. In the synagogues. In the place which was hardest against the gospel. God had prepared this man. He had spent years studying at the feet of Gamaliel. One of the Rambans, one of the greatest rabbis in all of Jewish tradition, even today, still considered one of the greatest rabbis in all of Jewish history. Paul studied at his feet. Paul was a bright learner. Paul knew all the Jewish stuff that needed to be known. Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. Paul knew the law. Paul knew the, the 613 or 639 hedges about the law that every Jew is supposed to know so he can protect his obedience to the law. Paul knew the Jewish scriptures and he went to the synagogues and from the Jewish scriptures he preached Christ that he is the Son of God. Wow. God gave him a powerful testimony, but it was focused on Christ. The next thing that we see in our text tonight is that God got the attention of everyone around who saw his change in lifestyle. That's the verse we read and commented on just a moment ago, verse 21. All that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem? Go oh, back to the names of God. And he came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. God gives you a powerful testimony. You know what's going to make it most powerful? Is when those who do not believe, those who know what you like before, when they see the change in your life, that you no longer do what you used to do. The next thing that we discover in the text is God next causes spiritual growth, spiritual strength, and spiritual abilities for warfare. Paul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. God causes spiritual growth. God causes spiritual strength. God gives the gracious gift of ability in spiritual warfare. And that's what Paul speaks of in Ephesians 6. We began there this evening, spoke a little bit of it, but let me read it to you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's what Paul just got. He increased the more in strength. Be strong in the power of his might. Not your might, not the might of the flesh, but his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You say, but Paul was fighting with Jews there in the synagogue. He was con confounding the Jews. He was arguing with them. What was the spiritual power behind their arguments against Christ? We find it here. And that's why we're to take on the whole armor of God, 
that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You are preaching the gospel. Your feet are taking you places where others have not heard. And your purpose in going is to carry the gospel. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Do you think Paul had that armor on when he went boldly into the synagogue and preached Christ, that he is the Son of God? Of course he did. And here he's giving it to us in a nutshell. Here is the Apostle Paul speaking to us of what he had gone through praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then this verse 19, I'm glad this one is included. And for me, Paul asking the Ephesians to pray for him. Remember, it was there at Ephesus where he had led those men to Christ who were Jews, 12 of them. Remember, it was there at Ephesus where he gives his final farewell. It is there at Ephesus where he writes his magnificent, or to Ephesus, that he writes his magnificent epistle to the Ephesians. It is these people that he asks to pray for him. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That is Christ. Not focusing on himself, but focusing on Christ. Dear people, every preacher needs that prayer. Pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What this passage tonight is telling us is and it's expressed all through the New Testament that the Christian life is a life of apologetics of defending the faith of refuting the gainsayers of offering irrefutable proof from scripture of the truth of the gospel of the claims of Christ and of accountability before God, who is the God of judgment, proving that this is the very Christ, Acts 9.22. That's what Paul was doing. That's a ministry of apologetics, defending the faith, refuting gainsayers and offering irrefutable proof from Scripture of the truth of the gospel, the claims of Christ, and of accountability before God of judgment coming. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our text tonight and how we thank you for the transformation in the life of Saul that you made when he trusted Christ. Father, we know theologically that all of this was a matter of your eternal counsels and purposes. But before his salvation, the Apostle Paul was killing Christians. He was a different man than after the point at which he trusted Christ and his life was changed. Father, I pray that you will enable each one of us as we look at our lives to say, has there been a difference from the time that I was not saved to the time that I trusted Christ? and had my eyes open spiritually. Is there a difference now in my life that is visible to the world? Am I saved but living a carnal life? Am I a carnal Christian? Or am I a Christian who is filled with the Spirit who manifests at least nine of those external character qualities that occur when the Spirit fills every aspect of every member of 
my body, my life. Father, I pray that each one of us will examine our hearts carefully to make sure that we are in the faith and not reprobate. Thank you again for your word. We pray for your blessings upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.